This audio edition of Dr. Benjamin Warfield's article, The Idea of Systematic Theology, is brought to you free of charge by reformedaudio.org. We invite you to visit our website and take a look at the theological and historical resources we have available. The Idea of Systematic Theology by Dr. Benjamin B. Warfield Originally published in the Presbyterian and Reformed Review, Volume 7, 1896, pages 243 to 271. The term systematic theology has long been in somewhat general use, especially in America, to designate one of the theological disciplines, and, on the whole, it appears to be a sufficiently exact designation of this discipline. It has not, of course, escaped criticism. The main faults that have been found with it are succinctly summed up by a recent writer in the following compact phrases. Quote, The expression systematic theology is really an impertinent tautology. It is a tautology insofar as a theology that is not systematic or methodical would be no theology. The idea of rational method lies in the word logos, which forms part of the term theology. And it is an impertinence insofar as it suggests that there are other theological disciplini or departments of theology which are not methodical. Is not this, however, just a shade hypercritical? What is meant by calling this discipline systematic theology is not that it deals with its material in a systematic or methodical way, and the other disciplines do not, but that it presents its material in the form of a system. Other disciplines may use a chronological, a historical, or some other method. This discipline must needs employ a systematic, that is to say, a philosophical or scientific method. It might be equally well designated, therefore, philosophical theology or scientific theology. But we should not, by the adoption of one of these terms, escape the ambiguities which are charged against the term systematic theology. Other theological disciplines may also claim to be philosophical or scientific. If exegesis should be systematic, it should also be scientific. If history should be methodical, it should also be philosophical. An additional ambiguity would be brought to these terms from their popular usage there would be danger that philosophical theology should be misapprehended as theology dominated by some philosophical system. There would be a similar danger that scientific theology should be misunderstood as theology reduced to an empirical science or dependent upon an experimental method. Nevertheless, these terms also would fairly describe what we mean by systematic theology. They, too, would discriminate it from its sister disciplines, as the philosophical discipline which investigates, from the philosophical standpoint, the matter with which all the disciplines deal. And they would keep clearly before our minds the main fact in the case, namely, that systematic theology, as distinguished from its sister disciplines, is a science, and is to be conceived as a science and treated as a science. The two designations, philosophical theology and scientific theology, are practically synonymous but they differ in their connotation as the terms philosophy and science differ. The distinction between these terms in a reference like the present would seem to be that between the whole and one of its parts. Philosophy is the scientia scientiarum. What a science does for a division of knowledge, that philosophy essays do for the mass of knowledge. A science reduces a section of our knowledge to order and harmony. Philosophy reduces the sciences to order and harmony. Accordingly, there are many sciences and but one philosophy. We therefore so far agree with Professor D.W. Simon, whom we have quoted above in order to disagree with him, when he says that, quote, what a science properly understood does for a subsystem that philosophy aims to do for the system which the subsystems constitute. Its function is so to grasp the whole that every part shall find its proper place therein and the parts that they shall form an orderly organic whole. So to correlate the reals, which with their interactivities make up the world or the universe, that the whole shall be seen in its harmony and unity, and that to every individual real shall be assigned the place in which it can be seen to be discharging its proper functions. This, as will be at once perceived, is the function of each science in its own sphere. To call systematic theology, philosophical theology, or scientific theology, would therefore be all one in essential meaning. Only when we call it philosophical theology, we should be conceiving it as a science among the sciences and should have our eye upon its place in the universal sum of knowledge, while when we call it scientific theology, 
our mind should be occupied with it in itself, as it were in isolation, and with the proper mode of dealing with its material. In either case, we are affirming that it deals with its material as an organizable system of knowledge, that it deals with it from the philosophical point of view, that it is, in other words, in its essential nature, a science. It is possible that the implications of this determination are not always fully realized. When we have made the simple assertion of systematic theology that it is in its essential nature a science, we have already determined most of the vexing questions which arise concerning it in a formal point of view. In this single predicate is implicitly included a series of affirmations which, when taken together, will give us a rather clear conception not only of what systematic theology is, but also of what it deals with, whence it obtains its material, and for what purpose it exists. Section 1. First of all, then, let us observe that to say that systematic theology is a science is to deny that it is a historical discipline, and to affirm that it seeks to discover not what has been or is held to be true, but what is ideally true. In other words, it is to declare that it deals with absolute truth and aims at organizing into a concatenated system all the truth in its sphere. Geology is a science, and on that very account there cannot be two geologies. Its matter is all the well-authenticated facts in its sphere, and its aim is to digest all these facts into one all-comprehending system. There may be rival psychologies which fill the world with vain jangling, but they do not strive together in order that they may obtain the right to exist side by side in equal validity, but in strenuous effort to supplant and supersede one another. There can be but one true science of mind. In like manner, just because theology is a science, there can be but one theology. This all-embracing system will brook no rival in its sphere, and there can be two theologies only at the cost of one or both of them being imperfect, incomplete, false. It is because theology, in accordance with a somewhat prevalent point of view, is often looked upon as a historical rather than a scientific discipline, that it is so frequently spoken of and defined as if it were but one of many similar schemes of thought. There is no doubt such a thing as Christian theology, as distinguished from Buddhist theology or Mohammedan theology, and man may study it as the theological implication of Christianity considered as one of the world's religions. But when studied from this point of view, it forms a section of a historical discipline and furnishes its share of facts for a history of religions, on the data supplied by which a science or philosophy of religion may in turn be based. We may also, no doubt, speak of the Pelagian and Augustinian theologies, or of the Calvinistic and Arminian theologies. But again, we are speaking as historians and from a historical point of view. The Pelagian and Augustinian theologies are not two coordinate sciences of theology. They are rival theologies. If one is true, just so far the other is false, and there is but one theology. This we may identify as an empirical fact with either or neither, but it is at all events one, inclusive of all theological truth and exclusive of all else as false or not germane to the subject. In asserting that theology is a science, then, we assert that, in its subject matter, it includes all the facts belonging to that sphere of truth which we call theological, and we deny that it needs or will admit of limitation by a discriminating adjectival definition. We may speak of it as Christian theology, just as we may speak of it as true theology, if we mean thereby only more fully to describe what, as a matter of fact, theology is found to be, but not if we mean thereby to discriminate it from some other assumed theology thus erected to a coordinate position with it. We may describe our method of procedure in attempting to ascertain and organize the truths that come before us for building into the system, and so speak of logical or inductive, of speculative or organic theology. Or we may separate the one body of theology into its members, and, just as we speak of surface and organic geology, or of physiological and direct psychology, so speak of the theology of grace and of sin, or of natural and revealed theology. But all these are but designations of methods of procedure in dealing with the one whole, or of the various sections that together constitute the one whole, which in its completeness is the science of theology, and which, as a science, is inclusive of all the truth in its sphere, however ascertained, however presented, however defended. Section 2. 
There is much more than this included, however, in calling theology a science. For the very existence of any science, three things are presupposed. One, the reality of its subject matter. Two, the capacity of the human mind to apprehend, receive into itself, and rationalize this subject matter. And three, some medium of communication by which the subject matter is brought before the mind and presented to it for apprehension. There could be no astronomy, for example, if there were no heavenly bodies. And though the heavenly bodies existed, there could still be no science of them were there no mind to apprehend them. Facts do not make a science. Even facts as apprehended do not make a science. They must be not only apprehended, but also so far comprehended as to be rationalized and thus combined into a correlated system. The mind brings to every science somewhat which, though included in the facts, is not derived from the facts considered in themselves alone, as isolated data, or even as data perceived in some sort of relation to one another. Though they be thus known, science is not yet, and is not born save through the efforts of the mind in subsuming the facts under its own intuitions and forms of thought. No mind is satisfied with a bare cognition of facts. Its very constitution forces it on to a restless energy until it succeeds in working these facts not only into a network of correlated relations among themselves, but also into a rational body of thought correlated to itself and its necessary modes of thinking. The condition of science, then, is that the facts which fall within its scope shall be such as stand in relation not only to our faculties, so that they may be apprehended, but also to our mental constitution, so that they may be so far understood as to be rationalized and wrought into a system relative to our thinking. Thus a science of aesthetics presupposes an aesthetic faculty, and a science of morals a moral nature, as truly as a science of logic presupposes a logical apprehension, and a science of mathematics a capacity to comprehend the relations of numbers. But still again, though the facts had real existence, and the mind were furnished with a capacity for their reception and for a sympathetic estimate and embracing of them in their relations, no science could exist were there no media by which the facts should be brought before and communicated to the mind. The transmitter and intermediating wire are as essential for telegraphing as the message and the receiving instrument. Subjectively speaking, sense perception is the essential basis of all science of external things, self-consciousness of internal things. But objective media are also necessary. For example, there could be no astronomy, were there no trembling ether through whose delicate telegraphy the facts of light and heat are transmitted to us from the suns and systems of the heavens. Subjective and objective conditions of communication must unite before the facts that constitute the material of a science can be placed before the mind that gives it its form. The sense of sight is essential to astronomy, yet the sense of sight would be useless for forming an astronomy were there no objective ethereal messengers to bring us news from the stars. With these an astronomy becomes possible, but how meager an astronomy compared with the new possibilities which have opened out with the discovery of a new medium of communication in the telescope, followed by still newer media in the subtle instruments by which our modern investigators not only weigh the spheres in their courses, but analyze them into their chemical elements, map out the heavens in a chart, and separate the suns into their primary constituents. Like all other sciences, therefore, theology, for its very existence as a science, presupposes the objective reality of the subject matter with which it deals, the subject capacity of the human mind so far to understand this subject matter as to be able to subsume it under the forms of its thinking and to rationalize it into not only a comprehensive but also a comprehensible whole, and the existence of trustworthy media of communication by which the subject matter is brought to the mind and presented before it for perception and understanding. That is to say, 1. The affirmation that theology is a science presupposes the affirmation that God is and that he has relation to his creatures. Were there no God, there could be no theology. Nor could there be a theology if, though he existed, he existed out of relation with his creatures. The whole body of philosophical apologetics is, therefore, presupposed in and underlies the structure of scientific theology. 2. The affirmation that theology is a science 
presupposes the affirmation that man has a religious nature, that is, a nature capable of understanding not only that God is, but also, to some extent, what he is. Not only that he stands in relations with his creatures, but also what those relations are. Had man no religious nature, he might, indeed, apprehend certain facts concerning God, but he could not so understand him in his relations to man as to be able to respond to those facts in a true and sympathetic embrace. The total product of the great science of religion, which investigates the nature and workings of this element in man's mental constitution, is therefore presupposed in and underlies the structure of scientific theology. 3. The affirmation that theology is a science presupposes the affirmation that there are media of communication by which God and divine things are brought before the minds of men, that they may perceive them and, in perceiving, understand them. In other words, when we affirm that theology is a science, we affirm not only the reality of God's existence and our capacity so far to understand him, but we affirm that he has made himself known to us. We affirm the objective reality of a revelation. Were there no revelation of God to man, our capacity to understand him would lie dormant and unawakened. And though he really existed, it would be to us as if he were not. There would be a God to be known and a mind to know him, but theology would be as impossible as if there were neither the one nor the other. Not only, then, philosophical, but also the whole mass of historical apologetics by which the reality of revelation and its embodiment in the scriptures are vindicated is presupposed in and underlies the structure of scientific theology. Section 3. In thus developing the implications of calling theology a science, we have already gone far towards determining our exact conception of what theology is. We have, in effect, for example, settled our definition of theology. A science is defined from its subject matter, and the subject matter of theology is God in his nature and in his relations with his creatures. Theology is, therefore, that science which treats of God and of the relations between God and the universe. To this definition most theologians have actually come. And those who define theology as the science of God mean the term God in a broad sense as inclusive also of his relations, while others exhibit their sense of the need of this inclusiveness by calling it the science of God and of divine things, while still others speak of it more loosely as the science of the supernatural. These definitions fail rather in precision of language than in correctness of conception. Others, however, go astray in the conception itself. Thus, theologians of the school of Schleiermacher usually derive their definition from the sources rather than the subject matter of the science, and so speak of theology as the science of faith or the like, a thoroughly unscientific procedure even though our view of the sources be complete and unexceptionable, which is certainly not the case with this school. Quite as confusing is it to define theology, as is very currently done and often as an outgrowth of this same subjective tendency as the science of religion, or even, pressing to its greatest extreme the historical conception, which as often underlies this type of definition, as the science of the Christian religion. Theology and religion are parallel products of the same body of facts in diverse spheres, the one in the sphere of thought and the other in the sphere of life. And the definition of theology as the science of religion thus confounds the product of the facts concerning God and his relations with his creatures working through the hearts and lives of men with those facts themselves. And consequently, whenever strictly understood, bases theology not on the facts of the divine revelation, but on the facts of the religious life. This leads ultimately to a confusion of the two distinct disciplines of theology, the subject matter of which is objective, and the science of religion, the subject matter of which is subjective, with the effect of lowering the data of theology to the level of the aspirations and imaginings of man's own heart. Wherever this definition is found, either a subjective conception of theology which reduces it to a branch of psychology, may be suspected, or else a historical conception of it, a conception of Christian theology, as one of the many theologies of the world, parallel with, even if unspeakably truer than, the others with which it is classed and in conjunction with which it furnishes us with a full account of religion. 
When so conceived, it is natural to take a step further and permit the methodology of the science, as well as its idea, to be determined by its distinguishing element. Thus theology, in contradiction to its very name, becomes Christocentric. No doubt Christian theology, as a historical discipline, is Christocentric. It is by its doctrine of redemption that it is differentiated from all the other theologies that the world has known. But theology as a science is and must be theocentric. So soon as we firmly grasp it from the scientific point of view, we see that there can be but one science of God and of his relations to his universe, and we no longer seek a point of discrimination, but rather a center of development. And we quickly see that there can be but one center about which so comprehensive a subject matter can be organized, the conception of God. He that hath seen Christ has beyond doubt seen the Father. But it is one thing to make Christ the center of theology so far as he is one with God, and another thing to organize all theology around him as the theanthropos and in his specifically theanthropic work. Section 4. Not only, however, is our definition of theology thus set for us, we have also determined in advance our conception of its sources. We have already made use of the term revelation to designate the medium by which the facts concerning God and his relations to his creatures are brought before men's minds, and so made the subject matter of a possible science. The word accurately describes the condition of all knowledge of God. If God be a person, it follows by stringent necessity that he can be known only so far as he reveals or expresses himself. And it is but the converse of this that if there be no revelation, there can be no knowledge and, of course, no systematized knowledge or science of God. Our reaching up to him in thought and inference is possible only because he condescends to make himself intelligible to us, to speak to us through work or word, to reveal himself. We hazard nothing, therefore, in saying that, as the condition of all theology is a revealed God, so, without limitation, the sole source of theology is revelation. In so speaking, however, we have no thought of doubting that God's revelation of himself is in diverse manners. We have no desire to deny that he has never left man without witness of his eternal power and Godhead, or that he has multiplied the manifestations of himself in nature and providence and grace, so that every generation has had abiding and unmistakable evidence that he is, that he is the good God, and that he is a God who marketh iniquity. Under the broad skirts of the term revelation, every method of manifesting himself which God uses in communicating knowledge of his being and attributes may find shelter for itself. Whether it be through those visible things of nature, whereby his invisible things are clearly seen, or through the constitution of the human mind, with its causal judgment indelibly stamped upon it, or through that voice of God that we call conscience, which proclaims his moral law within us, or through his providence in which he makes bare his arm for the government of the nations, or through the exercises of his grace, our experience under the tutelage of the Holy Ghost, or whether it be through the open visions of his prophets, the divinely breathed pages of his written word, the divine life of the word himself. How God reveals himself, in what diverse manners he makes himself known to his creatures, is thus the subsequent question, by raising which we distribute the one source of theology, revelation, into the various methods of revelation each of which brings us true knowledge of God, and all of which must be taken account of in building our knowledge into one all-comprehending system. It is the accepted method of theology to infer that the God that made the eye must himself see, that the God who sovereignly distributes his favors in the secular world may be sovereign in grace too, that the heart that condemns itself but repeats the condemnation of the greater God that the songs of joy in which the Christian's happy soul voices its sense of God's gratuitous mercy are valid evidence that God has really dealt graciously with it. It is with no reserve that we accept all these sources of knowledge of God, nature, providence, Christian experience, as true and valid sources, the well-authenticated data yielded by which are to be received by us as revelations of God, and as such to be placed alongside of the revelations in the written word and wrought with them into one system. As a matter of fact, 
Theologians have always so dealt with them, and doubtless they always will so deal with them. But to perceive, as all must perceive, that every method by which God manifests himself is, so far as this manifestation can be clearly interpreted, a source of knowledge of him, and must, therefore, be taken account of in framing all our knowledge of him into one organic whole, is far from allowing that there are no differences among these various manifestations in the amount of revelation they give, the clearness of their message, the ease and certainty with which they may be interpreted, or the importance of the special truths which they are fitted to convey. Far rather is it a priori likely that if there are diverse manners in which God has revealed himself, he has not revealed precisely the same message through each, that these diverse manners correspond also to diverse messages of diverse degrees of importance delivered with diverse degrees of clearness. And the mere fact that he has included in these diverse manners a copious revelation in a written word delivered with an authenticating accompaniment of signs and miracles proved by recorded prophecies with their recorded fulfillments and pressed with the greatest solemnity upon the attention and consciences of men as the very word of the living God who has by it made all the wisdom of men foolishness, nay, proclaimed as containing within itself the formulation of his truth, the proclamation of his law, the discovery of his plan of salvation, this mere fact, I say, would itself, and prior to all comparison, raise an overwhelming presumption that all the others of the diverse manners of God's revelation were insufficient for the purposes for which revelation is given, whether on account of defect in the amount of their communication, or insufficiency of attestation, or uncertainty of interpretation, or fatal one-sidedness in the character of the revelation they are adapted to give. We need not be surprised, therefore, that on actual examination such imperfections are found undeniably to attach to all forms of what we may, for the sake of discrimination, speak of as mere manifestations of God, and that thus the revelation of God in his written word in which are included the only authentic records of the revelation of him through the incarnate word, is easily shown not only to be incomparably superior to all other manifestations of him in the fullness, richness, and clearness of its communications, but also to contain the sole discovery of much that it is most important for the soul to know as to its state and destiny, and of much that is most precious in our whole body of theological knowledge. The superior lucidity of this revelation makes it the norm of interpretation for what is revealed so much more darkly through the other methods of manifestation. The glorious character of the discoveries made in it throws all other manifestations into comparative shadow. The amazing fullness of its disclosures renders what they can tell us of little relative value, and its absolute completeness for the needs of man, taking up and reiteratingly repeating in the clearest of language all that can be wrung from their sometimes enigmatic indications, and then adding to this a vast body of still more momentous truth, undiscoverable through them, all but supersedes their necessity. With the fullest recognition of the validity of all the knowledge of God and his ways with men, which can be obtained through the manifestations of his power and divinity in nature and history and grace, and the frankest allowance that the written word is given not to destroy the manifestations of God, but to fulfill them, the theologian must yet refuse to give these sources of knowledge a place alongside of the written word, in any other sense than that he gladly admits that they, alike with it, but in unspeakably lower measure, do tell us of God. And nothing can be a clearer indication of a decadent theology or of a decaying faith than a tendency to neglect the word in favor of some one or of all of the lesser sources of theological truth, as fountains from which to draw our knowledge of divine things. This were to prefer the flickering rays of a taper to the blazing light of the sun, to elect to draw our water from a muddy run rather than to dip it from the broad bosom of the pure fountain itself. Nevertheless, men have often sought to still the cravings of their souls with a purely natural theology. And there are men today who prefer to derive their knowledge of what God is and what he will do for man from an analysis of the implications of their own religious feelings, not staying to consider that nature, red in tooth and claw with raven, can but direct our eyes to the God of law, whose deadly letter kills, 
so that our feelings must needs point us to the God of our imperfect apprehensions or of our unsanctified desires, not to the God that is, so much as to the God that we would fain should be. The natural result of resting on the revelations of nature is despair, while the inevitable end of making our appeal to even the Christian heart is to make for ourselves refuges of lies in which there is neither truth nor safety. We may indeed admit that it is valid reasoning to infer from the nature of the Christian life what are the modes of God's activities toward his children, to see, for instance, in conviction of sin and the sudden peace of the newborn soul, God's hand in slaying that he may make alive, his almighty power in raising the spiritually dead. But how easy to overstep the limits of valid inference, and, forgetting that it is the body of Christian truth, known and assimilated, that determines the type of Christian experience, confuse in our inferences what is from man with what is from God, and condition and limit our theology by the undeveloped Christian thought of the man or his times. The interpretation of the data included in what we have learned to call the Christian consciousness, whether of the individual or of the church at large, is a process so delicate, so liable to error, so inevitably swayed to this side or that by the currents that flow up and down in the soul, that probably few satisfactory inferences could be drawn from it had we not the norm of Christian experience and its dogmatic implications recorded for us in the perspicuous pages of the written word. But even were we to suppose that the interpretation was easy and secure, and that we had before us, in an infallible formulation, all the implications of the religious experience of all the men who have ever known Christ, we have no reason to believe that the whole body of facts thus obtained would suffice to give us a complete theology. After all, we know in part and we feel in part. It is only when that which is perfect shall appear that we shall know or experience all that Christ has in store for us. With the fullest acceptance, therefore, of the data of the theology of the feelings, no less than of natural theology, when their results are validly obtained and sufficiently authenticated as trustworthy, as divinely revealed facts which must be wrought into our system, it remains nevertheless true that we should be confined to a meager and doubtful theology were these data not confirmed, reinforced, and supplemented by the surer and fuller revelations of Scripture, and that the Holy Scriptures are the source of theology in not only a degree, but also a sense in which nothing else is. There may be a theology without the Scriptures, a theology of nature, gathered by painful and slow and sometimes doubtful processes from what man sees around him in external nature and the course of history, and what he sees within him of nature and of grace. In like manner, there may be and has been an astronomy of nature, gathered by man in his natural state, without help from aught but his naked eyes, as he watched in the fields by night. But what is this astronomy of nature to the astronomy that has become possible through the wonderful appliances of our observatories? The word of God is to theology as, but vastly more than, these instruments are to astronomy. It is the instrument which so far increases the possibilities of the science as to revolutionize it and to place it upon a height from which it can never more descend. What would be thought of the deluded man who, discarding the new methods of research, should insist on acquiring all the astronomy which he would admit from the unaided observation of his own myopic and astigmatic eyes? Much more deluded is he who, neglecting the instrument of God's word written, would confine his admissions of theological truth to what he could discover from the broken lights that play upon external nature, and the faint gleams of a dying or even a slowly reviving light which arise in his own sinful soul. Ah, no! The telescope first made a real science of astronomy possible, and the scriptures form the only sufficing source of theology. Section 5. Under such a conception of its nature and sources, we are led to consider the place of systematic theology among the other theological disciplines as well as among the other sciences in general. Without encroaching upon the details of theological encyclopedia, we may adopt here the usual fourfold distribution of the theological disciplines into the exegetical, the historical, the systematic, and the practical, with only the correction of prefixing to them a fifth department of apologetical theology. 
The place of systematic theology in this distribution is determined by its relation to the preceding disciplines, of which it is the crown and head. Apologetical theology prepares the way for all theology by establishing its necessary presuppositions without which no theology is possible. The existence and essential nature of God, the religious nature of man which enables him to receive a revelation from God, the possibility of a revelation, and its actual realization in the scriptures. It thus places the scriptures in our hands for investigation and study. Exegetical theology receives these inspired writings from the hands of apologetics and investigates their meaning, presenting us with a body of detailed and substantiated results, culminating in a series of organized systems of biblical history, biblical ethics, biblical theology, and the like, which provide material for further use in the more advanced disciplines. Historical theology investigates the progressive realization of Christianity in the lives, hearts, worship, and thought of men, issuing not only in a full account of the history of Christianity, but also in a body of facts which come into use in the more advanced disciplines, especially in the way of the manifold experiments that have been made during the ages in Christian organization, worship, living, and creed building, as well as of the sifted results of the reasoned thinking and deep experience of Christian truth during the whole past. Systematic theology does not fail to strike its roots deeply into this matter furnished by historical theology. It knows how to profit by the experience of all past generations in their efforts to understand and define, to systematize and defend revealed truth. And it thinks of nothing so little as lightly to discard the conquests of so many hard-fought fields. It therefore gladly utilizes all the material that historical theology brings it, accounting it indeed the very precipitate of the Christian consciousness of the past. But it does not use it crudely or at first hand for itself, but accepts it as investigated, explained, and made available by the sister discipline of historical theology, which alone can understand it or draw from it its true lessons. It certainly does not find in it its chief or primary source, and its relation to historical theology is, in consequence, far less close than that in which it stands to exegetical theology, which is its true source and a special handmaid. The independence of exegetical theology is seen in the fact that it does its work wholly without thought or anxiety as to the use that is to be made of its results, and that it furnishes a vastly larger body of data than can be utilized by any one discipline. It provides a body of historical, ethical, liturgic, ecclesiastical facts, as well as a body of theological facts. But so far as its theological facts are concerned, it provides them chiefly that they may be used by systematic theology as material out of which to build its system. This is not to forget the claims of biblical theology. It is rather to emphasize its value and to afford occasion for explaining its true place in the encyclopedia and its true relations on the one side to exegetical theology and on the other to systematics a matter which appears to be even yet imperfectly understood in some quarters. Biblical theology is not a section of historical theology, although it must be studied in a historical spirit and has a historical face. It is rather the ripest fruit of exegetics, and exegetics has not performed its full task until its scattered results in the way of theological data are gathered up into a full and articulated system of biblical theology. It is to be hoped that the time will come when no commentary will be considered complete until the capstone is placed upon its fabric by closing chapters gathering up into systematized exhibits the unsystematized results of the continuous exegesis of the text in the spheres of history, ethics, theology, and the like. The task of biblical theology, in a word, is the task of coordinating the scattered results of continuous exegesis into a concatenated whole, whether with reference to a single book of scripture or to a body of related books or to the whole scriptural fabric. Its chief object is not to find differences of conception between the various writers, though some recent studies of the subject seem to think this is so much their duty that when they cannot find differences they make them. It is to reproduce the theological thought of each writer or group of writers in the form in which it lay in their own minds so that we may be enabled to look at all their theological statements at their angle, 
and to understand all their deliverances as modified and conditioned by their own point of view. Its exegetical value lies just in this circumstance, that it is only when we have thus concatenated an author's theological statements into a whole that we can be sure that we have understood them as he understood them in detail. A light is inevitably thrown back from biblical theology upon the separate theological deliverances as they occur in the text, such as subtly colors them, and often, for the first time, gives them to us in their true setting, and thus enables us to guard against perverting them when we adapt them to our use. This is a noble function, and could students of biblical theology only firmly grasp it, once for all, as their task, it would prevent this important science from being brought into contempt through a tendency to exaggerate differences in form of statement into divergences of view, and so to force the deliverances of each book into a strange and unnatural combination in the effort to vindicate a function for this discipline. The relation of biblical theology to systematic theology is based on a true view of its function. Systematic theology is not founded on the direct and primary results of the exegetical process. It is founded on the final and complete results of exegesis as exhibited in biblical theology. Not exegesis itself, then, but biblical theology provides the material for systematics. Biblical theology is not, then, a rival of systematics. It is not even a parallel product of the same body of facts provided by exegesis. It is the basis and source of systematics. Systematic theology is not a concatenation of the scattered theological data furnished by the exegetic process. It is the combination of the already concatenated data given to it by biblical theology. It uses the individual data furnished by exegesis in a word, not crudely, not independently for itself, but only after these data have been worked up into biblical theology and have received from it their final coloring and subtlest shades of meaning. In other words, only in their true sense and after exegetics has said its last word upon them. Just as we shall attain our finest and truest conception of the person and work of Christ, not by crudely trying to combine the scattered details of his life and teaching as given in our four Gospels into one patchwork life and account of his teaching, but far more rationally and far more successfully by first catching Matthew's full conception of Jesus, and then Mark's, and then Luke's, and then John's, and combining these four conceptions into one rounded whole. So we gain our truest systematics, not by at once working together the separate dogmatic statements in the scriptures, but by combining them in their due order and proportion as they stand in the various theologies of the scriptures. Thus we are enabled to view the future whole, not only in its parts, but in the several combinations of the parts, and looking at it from every side to obtain a true conception of its solidity and strength, and to avoid all exaggeration or falsification of the details in giving them place in the completed structure. And thus we do not make our theology, according to our own pattern, as a mosaic out of the fragments of the biblical teaching, but rather look out from ourselves upon it as a great prospect, framed out of the mountains and plains of the theologies of the scriptures, and strive to attain a point of view from which we can bring the whole landscape into our field of sight. From this point of view, we find no difficulty in understanding the relation in which the several disciplines stand to one another with respect to their contents. The material that systematics draws from other biblical sources may be here left momentarily out of account. The actual contents of the theological results of the exegetic process of biblical theology and of systematics with this limitation, may be said to be the same. The immediate work of exegesis may be compared to the work of a recruiting officer. It draws out from the mass of mankind the men who are to constitute the army. Biblical theology organizes these men into companies and regiments and corps, arranged in marching order and accoutred for service. Systematic theology combines these companies and regiments and corps into an army, a single and unitary whole, determined by its own all-pervasive principle. It, too, is composed of men, the same men which were recruited by exegetics. But it is composed of these men, not as individuals merely, but in their due relations to the other men of their companies and regiments and corps. The simile is far from a perfect one, but it may illustrate the mutual relations of the disciplines, and also, perhaps, suggest the historical element that attaches to biblical theology, 
and the element of all-inclusive systemization which is inseparable from systematic theology. It is just this element, determining the spirit and therefore the methods of systematic theology, which, along with its greater inclusiveness, discriminates it from all forms of biblical theology, the spirit of which is purely historical.